It could be a defining moment or could further tear a country apart. Egypt votes on a new constitution, an important test for its army-backed leaders. But with opposition groups boycotting the referendum, how credible can it be? This is Inside Story. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Two days of voting, the result, pretty much a foregone conclusion. But as with anything to do with Egypt, who knows what's coming next? This vote was a constitutional referendum, actually. It'll pave the way for presidential and parliamentary elections. But given it came about from the overthrow of an elected president, there have been those who called for a boycott, including the now banned Muslim Brotherhood. Despite tight security, supporters of that ousted President Mohamed Morsi clashed with Egyptian forces and at least 11 people have been killed. The new constitution will give Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, seen here in the dark glasses and the khaki fatigues, more power over everyday life. But turnout will be important. The referendum under Morsi won more than 60% backing, but less than a third of eligible voters actually turned out. This vote will need more than that to give the state an electoral seal of legitimacy. But for those in favour or those against the referendum, feelings are running high. The National Coalition to Support Legitimacy announces its decision to boycott this invalid referendum that is being conducted by the bloody fascist coup authority and the coalition is calling upon the Egyptian people to boycott it. Moving away from the constitutional amendments would lead to chaos. These are all factors that affected the Nur party's position. And we can confirm that not only are we saying yes, but we hope that all Egyptians would also vote yes. We can never participate and give legitimacy to a regime which fools the people and tries to act like it is a civil democratic regime, while it is neither democratic nor civil. This constitution is a reflection of Egypt's current situation, along with the challenges Egypt and the Egyptian society face. Therefore, there is a great focus on freedoms, rights and the benefits of the Egyptian people, without neglecting any segment of society. So plenty to discuss with our guests, so why don't we meet them. In Washington, Dussein is Hussein Ibish, a commentator, author and contributor to Foreign Policy magazine. In Seattle, Marwan Marziad, who's a specialist in civil military relations in the Middle East, currently teaching at the University of Washington there in Seattle. And joining us via Skype from Cairo, Yusuf Salhin, he is a spokesman for the students' anti-coup movement. We thank all of you for joining us on Inside Story. Before we get going, I do just want to rewind for a second because we need to address, and this is for our viewers as well, of course, how we even got here. Very brief history, but we're going to go right back to January 25th, 2011, and the start of the anti-government protests. Within weeks, of course, we saw the resignation of President Hosni Mubarak, and it was the Muslim Brotherhood's Mohamed Morsi who won the presidential elections in June of 2012. And in December, after a referendum, he signed off on a new constitution, the one which is effectively being replaced now. Of course, he was deposed in July of last year, and went on trial in November, charged with incitement to murder and violence. Which brings us all to this latest referendum, remembering all the while there have been more protests and more deaths. Hussein Ibish, if I can start with you in Washington, D.C. Sure. When you look at that sort of history, was Egypt, in your opinion, even ready for this referendum? When you've got, well, can you enact a democratic process when you've got groups being banned, when you've got protests going on, you, you just push forward and carry on? Um, I, I think Egypt needs a constitution, uh, and I think there's a national consensus that the one that was rammed through during the Morsi presidency, uh, and it was done, it was rammed through in several different ways. I mean, he issued a, a constitutional declaration that gave himself presidential powers, and then he re he rescinded that after the after protests. But it it, it sort of made people more comfortable with the uh, the, the kind of uh, very pro-Islamist constitution that was crafted by a stacked committee. Uh, and so I think that part of the uh, huge, overwhelming national consensus backing his ouster 
um, was a uh, against the the old constitution. So mm. Egypt needs a new constitution. Is this process perfect? No. But Egypt can't go forward without a new constitution. I have many qualms about this document, mm. but I think Egypt needs a constitution before it can go forward. It, well, it does. But it's the way the, the phrase that you used, that the last one was rammed through, and 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 fair enough. It just feels like yes. this one might be being rammed through as well, doomed to repeat the same mistakes. Well, not this, not in the same way. Not in the same way. Okay. Not uh, in. in not with a, a committee that is com utterly stacked, even though it is true that the Muslim Brotherhood is a banned organization now, but the committee, I think, was mo more representative than the last one. And secondly, there haven't been these maneuvers about, you know, sort of declaring, uh, as Morsi did himself, to have absolute authority, not subject to judicial review. Even his prior acts wouldn't be subject to judicial review. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that going on. And if you look at the document, it's an improvement over most of e e Egypt's constitutions since 1971. It, it doesn't compare well with what the Tunisians are crafting by consensus. So you could say, compared to the Tunisian process, the Egyptian process is profoundly flawed. Mm. But I think that Egypt hasn't got much choice but to have a constitution uh, that can provide for presidential and parliamentary elections mm. and hopefully sooner rather than later a national reconciliation. Yusuf Sultan, let me bring you into the conversation. I'm pretty sure I know what you're feeling about the referendum will be, but why don't you tell us? I would say, uh, first of all, the first results of uh, the referendum yesterday appeared with uh, 11 victims who were killed. Uh, by the coup forces. This is the first uh, result to come up. And then hundreds who were detained and of course from the very beginning of the coup till now there are thousands who have been killed, uh, thousands, uh, thousands who have been detained and tortured inside the coup prison, prisons. So what kind of constitutions that we're talking about here? Is it a constitution that um, enables the coup to take more power and assume more power over Egyptians. Um, I don't know how could we say that the committee of the constitution uh, was more uh, presentable while it's all appointed and not elected like the last uh, committee. Uh, still, the coup wiped five democratic processes, two referendums, three elections. So what kind of consensus that we're talking about? Um, it, this is not a consensus. This is not a democratic process. Um, it is an autocratic process by a military bloody coup who's trying to assume the power for itself. And we see the, the leader of the coup and the main leader of the coup is, is of course, is going to run for the presidential elections. In addition to this, um, okay. I don't know. Let me let me pause. Let me pause there, uh, Yusuf, and, and ask for a reaction from Marwan Maziad in Seattle to bring her into the conversation as well. Hi, Marwan. What, you know, we're talking about things there with Yusuf about consensus, uh, and that leads me to the idea of turnout as well. You know, there was low turnout in the last referendum. It has to be said, and it might look sort of the same sort of numbers this time around. I, is it all a maybe not legitimate process, but does it really speak for the people if you've got such a low turnout? Um. I think I agree mostly with your first speaker um, about the idea that this is a step along the way, but not necessarily perfect. But I think the consensus we're talking about is that things have to move forward versus looking back uh, and being stuck in a, in a, in a legal impasse. Uh, would, would I say that this constitution is great? No. Was the 2012 great? No. If you're comparing it to um, the American, the U.S. Constitution, as as brief as it is, just a, a number of uh, of rights and a short, memorable uh, piece of document. Uh, this is this is nothing. I mean, the process of everybody wanting a piece in this very long constitution and wanted to be represented in uh, in the constitution as if it's uh, it's law. Uh, I would critique that from here till tomorrow. But the fact is is that. It's a step that tells people that we are going to move forward with governance, with uh, a structure that can create political institutions. So the sentiment, I think the only consensus among Egyptians is that they want to fo uh, 
move forward and not keep resetting the, uh, re, re, the replay button, um, which we have been doing for three years now. So um, I think that's the only consensus we have, is that let's move uh, forward uh, with this, with, with what comes next. Okay, I like that you've brought up this so, idea of resetting and um, replaying, actually, because it kind of leads to where I wanted to go next. Obviously, it is worth for us and our viewers to look at some of the specifics of this proposed constitution to see how Egypt would, would change if it's voted in. And I want to run through some of those for us all now. Religion, that's an important part of Egyptian society. In this proposed constitution, Islam would remain the state religion, but there would be no more political parties based on religion, which would of course be a setback for movements like Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and Al-Azhar, the Sunni world's preeminent theological institution, would no longer need to be consulted by lawmakers on Islamic matters. The president would have the power to dissolve parliament. Uh, the military, well, it would have the authority to choose the defense minister for the next eight years. And military trials for civilians would continue, but only for specific cases. The judiciary is another winner. The proposed constitution will allow it to appoint senior positions. And in the police force, well, it's Supreme Council. This would be a new sort of level in the police, must be consulted on any new law affecting them, which would potentially block any attempts at reforms. Marwa, let me get a quick thought from you before moving back to our other guests. You talked about resetting and replaying, or not resetting, pressing the reset button. When I read through that, it feels like this is almost, in some respects, not all, but in some respects, going back to pre-2011 Egypt. I don't think so, especially if you're talking about the role of religion. In fact, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, Egypt was going to be on a track of a sunnification identity, actually, kind of uh, playing in the regional politics of where Iran is, where Syria at it, um, this proxy war between Shia and Sunni that started since the Iraq uh, war in 2003. And with the Muslim Brotherhood, there was more of uh, rallying this kind of identity. So when you compare the role of religion in the Constitution, uh, not having Al-Azhar being uh, other than just a consultative um, body or not having the article that states the sunnah and the, 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 the uh, uh, being the reference of what the identity of Egyptians are, is all of that takes away from that kind of uh, new uh, chartered identity for Egypt that was to be playing only for regional politics that now with the U.S. even making uh, some concessions mm -hmm. um, uh, towards uh, some peace talks with Iran, this is a shift in the regional politics. So I would say that the, the role of religion is being um, uh, uh, redefined in Egypt so that it stays out of politics and not be okay. abused the way it was going to, to become. Okay, so let me, but let that's me put, a major change, actually. Yeah, let me put that to Yusuf, actually, in Cairo. A lot of people watching, our international viewers, might think, you know, religion and politics, they should actually be kept apart. It's much better that way. Maybe that sort of change could actually help Egypt along the way. I don't mind, I don't. I never mind if, if Egyptian Egyptians mm. want this and choose this. But what if the majority of Egyptians who participated in two referendums, three elections, and they chose that constitution, what if they believe that the Islam is, helps in every aspect of life, it's a comprehensive religion? What if they believe so? What about, I'm also not comparing my country to any other country. Egypt is Egypt, I'm not comparing to the American constitution or whatever. And if we want to compare, there are lots of um, parties in Europe, especially in Germany, that's, for instance, that are based on religious um, um, uh, backgrounds. So um, it is not my choice, it is not other choice or individual's choice, it's the people's choice. And I'm, I don't think that is this um, rigid constitution, which is only um, propaganda, the only propaganda about it and campaigns is only yes. Nobody's ever about to say no. There is no one single uh, poster or banner in the whole country, and I challenge it, that says no. Whosoever is participating or going to streets to uh, say some campaigns for no or all detained and arrested, so what kind of democracy here that all Egyptian media, all campaigns, all posters, all the streets is full of yes and only yes. And then we say um, that's a democratic uh, process. This constitution and uh, this referendum is only with one choice, which is yes. It's taken for granted that it's going to pass. It doesn't mean, though, 
that we recognize it or accept it. That's why we totally um, boycott the whole process because if you, if the, the this coup, the bloody coup, is working as they claim for the uh, yes. interest and benefits of Egyptians, they would accept it five uh, democratic processes before. Okay, Hussein, can I bring you back? Uh, and look, we haven't I, actually heard I from I you in a while. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to respond to a couple of those points. Sure. I mean, uh, first of all, it's not it's not true that there aren't people who are openly calling for a no vote. There are there are people uh, left of center and on the religious right who, who are not affiliated with the Muslim Brotherhood and intellectuals who have said they don't like this constitution and they don't want people to vote for it. And they've said that publicly and they have not been arrested or silenced or anything like that. So there is a, a no vote or an abstention movement um, and uh, I, I think that needs to be acknowledged. At the same time, it's, it's, it is important to note that uh, while uh, the Salafist and Nur party uh, is to the religious right and the political right of the Muslim Brotherhood, they have endorsed this constitution. And Al-Azhar has not objected to the removal of the article in the, in the Morsi era constitution uh, that gave it a certain role in politics. And I, you know, for people who kind of want to paint this as you know, all the product of simply a military coup d'etat against legitimacy and democracy, I invite them to go back and look at who stood on the stage with General Sisi and President Mansour when they announced the ouster of President Morsi. It included everyone from uh, the Salafist Nur party to Al-Azhar to the Coptic Pope to the 70-member National Salvation Front, which may even dissolve itself after this constitution so each party can run separately, mm. uh, and uh, everybody in between. So in other words, it was the entirety of Egyptian society, except for the Muslim Brotherhood and Gama Islamiyah that, that I can identify, that supported the removal of President Morsi because there was no mechanism in place to do so. One of the good things about this constitution is that it gives parliament the ability ability to remove a president who is exceeding his authority, mm -hmm. and that's a good thing. Okay. One of the bad things is the increase in power for the military and the police, which you mentioned, which if you want to talk more about, I'd be happy to. We, we'll look at that. What I'm going to do, I'm going to let Yusuf reply really quickly, because uh, that was something you were responding, and then I'll bring Mawa back in. But Yusuf, just a really quick word from you. I don't know if um, those who read in the statement of the coup uh, are talking on behalf of all Egyptians. They just uh, were used, uh, they are all means for, that used and tools by the, the military leaders. I mean, I'm an Azhari, and in our movement, student scientific movement, Al Azhar University is known, and all Al Azhar educational system, schools, elementary schools, are known to be um, against the grand imam of the coup, are against every person and every leader of the coup, even, as, even if he's not from the military. So, if people represent themselves, okay, let's, let's talk about referendums that I've just mentioned twice. Let's talk about elections. People choose what they want. I, the, the Grand Imam of Azhar doesn't represent Egyptians. The Coptic uh, Pope, with all respect, he doesn't represent Egyptians. The, the, the General Sisi and whosoever attended um, this uh, statement, uh, mm -hmm do not any, in any way represent Egyptians. And okay. what about those Egyptians? I'm sorry. What about those Egyptians who are taking the streets for more than five months? Are those not, are those not Egyptians? Are all of them are Muslim Brotherhood? Okay, I'm one of them, and I'm not a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay, Yusuf, thank you for that. I want to move on to some other topics before we do run out of time, and I'm going to do that with Marwa now in Seattle. I want to talk personalities. Uh, Hussein mentioned General Al-Sisi before, and it is widely believed that he would run for president if this constitution goes through, which it probably will. Tell me about his um, political credentials. Does he, does he have the right political credentials to be a president of Egypt? Well, um, he has been political in the way he was reaching to a lot of people. There are a lot of people in Egypt that uh, are counting on him as a savior. Uh, I think um, this is problematic in of itself because 
uh, in Egypt we didn't want to create another cult of personality, as you say, mm -hmm. where there are no political institutions, where participation is not ensuing through a party or associations or civil society, or we don't want that to not emerge. Um, so that stands in the way. I think the route we're taking as Egyptians collectively, even though that this is a reaction to the other uh, way m the Muslim Brotherhood, unfortunately, have not turned themselves into the very political party they uh, try to mm. uh, create. So they start, they state the interest group that they are, the uh, exclusive group that they are. Um, that's that's the pathology of Egyptian politics in general. So this is what you have, an, an outcome of the sort. Uh, but I think if even if he has to run b based on uh, on. The, the calls from the people and uh, the sense of uh, this is a critical juncture for Egyptian uh, history where we need uh, a strong uh, leader who can lead. People can have kind of uh, an agreement on. Um, that has to be very short and that has to be uh, the, in the kind of intervention by which you create, you have room for creation of political institutions. If he does not do that and Unfortunately, it's very likely that he wouldn't do that. Mm. Um, then Egypt is going to be in these kind of re reset buttons mm -hmm. all the time. You know, you're re you're just going two steps backward. And I think uh, the rule is no political participation without political institutions. So mm. the streets are not going to be the vehicle through which Egyptians can uh, uh, express their needs. It has to be through. Uh, uh, legal framework, judicial, uh, process, uh, legislative yeah. framework, and executive, and, and, and yeah, so this is the real deal. And I think Egyptians, time and again, since 2011, have been uh, pressing this reset button to tell the world mm. and to tell everybody within Egypt and outside of it is that we are here for the real deal. Mm. Every time someone takes us on a detour of some sort, they just like stop and go and undo. Mm. I think. Uh, sooner or later, even if a General Sisi takes off his uh, regalia and mm -hmm. uh, wears the civilian suit and starts governing, uh, he will face these real questions. And unless he responds the way is expected of creating institutions in Egypt, I think the outcome will be more uh, unrest and instability. Hussein, quick thought from you on this, because I, 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 you know, Marwa brought up I the point. I share those concerns. Oh, go ahead then, yeah. No, sorry. No, yeah, no, I, I share those concerns. And, and I think that not only is it risky for Egypt uh, for uh, General Sisi to go from being defense minister to being president, although it is, it is a distinct possibility. I, I, also, I see all the problems uh, that she does, but I also see beyond that a risk for him. Uh, because he's in very firm control of the military now. If he leaves that and becomes president, becomes a politician, and uh, is essentially subject then to the vicissitudes of uh, popular opinion, mm. uh, and there can easily be a backlash as we've seen against any leader. I mean, this is the fourth government in Egypt in, th in three years, and we have no guarantee of how long it'll last. There's a honeymoon, it's an extended one, but it can, it can turn overnight, especially on economic issues. And I, I can see a logic and a rational rationalization for General Sisi to say no, someone like President, Interim President Mansour should run or somebody else and I will be defense minister and essentially in a way the power behind the throne and that might be a much more intelligent long-term strategy right. for him politically and for the military as an institution. We're running down on time now. Yusuf, let me bring the last word to you in Cairo for your thoughts on, well, I, again, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know where you'd come from, but a future Egypt potentially under uh, General Assisi. Okay, first of all, let me, take, let me talk about his yeah, running for the presidential elections. I mean, he's already the president. I mean, he just uh, made up a uh, fake say that it is a puppet uh, president, but who's running the whole thing is the General Assisi, of course, and he just wanted, wants it to be more official. That's why he's going to run for the, uh, for the presidential elections. The truth is, the majority of people are against that, that killer and murderer, and we're not going to stop until we bring every leader of this call to justice. Yusuf, thank you so much for your thoughts. So that's Yusuf South in, in Cairo. And also I'd like to thank our other two guests, Hussein Abish joining us from Washington, D.C., and Marwa Marziad in Seattle. Thank you all for your time today.
And just before we go, a reminder that we would like to be reporting on this referendum from inside Egypt. However, five of our journalists are still being held there. Producers Mohammed Fahmi and Bahar Mohammed and correspondent Peter Grester are accused of spreading lies harmful to state security and joining a terrorist group. Al Jazeera says the allegations are fabricated and is demanding their release. The three are being held in separate cells in Torah prison outside of Cairo. The other two journalists are from our sister channels. Abdel Al Shami is a reporter and Mohammed Badr is a cameraman. They have been detained for five months now. Just a reminder, you'll be able to find this program at facebook.com slash AJ Inside Story. You can join the discussion there, like us as well while you're at it. I'm Kamal Santamari from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again soon.